Right, uh, it's right at the top of the hour. Hello and welcome uh, to our special COVID-19 uh, session number 34. Um, this is a series that we have dedicated to diagnostics in the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Anafi Mataka, and as usual, I am always honored and happy to be your host. Um, today's topic is, uh, again, a very special one. But before that, I just hope there is still some time limit to, for me to be able to wish you um, a happy new year, despite the beginning uh, that we have had, particularly with uh, the new variants coming through. As we all know, laboratory diagnosis, as we have said over and over again, is really the cornerstone of this fight uh, against the pandemic. And understanding uh, the outbreaks really requires testing insights. Hence, why we bring on this platform tools and diagnostics uh, that help us uh, achieve that goal. Today, we are focusing on manufacturers. Uh, manufacturers help us develop these uh, tools that we are able to be, that we should be able to use uh, to be able to know how we are doing uh, with, with the pandemic. And we are glad to uh, invite BD as well as Diasorin to grace our occasion today. Uh, just a few um, housekeeping rules as we start, as you all know, uh, please keep your comments and questions coming through into the chat box uh, as the presentation go through. This, as usual, is always is going to be a one hour session, which we shall have two presentations, first from BD and then the second one from Diasorin, each about 20 minutes each, uh, followed by a QA. and uh, a We shall take the questions as they come uh, into the chat box. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me invite our first presenter for today, uh, who is uh, Dr. Celine Roger uh, Delbert, who is the Vice President of uh, Research and Development Integrated Diagnostic Solutions at BD. Uh, Celine, uh, please share your slides and take us through. Over. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me share the slide with you. Okay, so let's get started. Thank you for the invitation. Um, as said, I'm the Vice President of R&D for BD Diagnostic, Integrated Diagnostic Solutions. And my talk will focus on an antigen test, the BD variator SARS-CoV-2 assay. Let's start quickly with an introduction of uh, BD. BD is one of the largest um, global medical company, one of the top five, with about 16 billion of annual revenues. It, it's um, somewhat a very old company, uh, founded in 1897. We are focusing on solutions from treatment of disease to the process of care, uh, providing solutions for providers, laboratories, hospitals. Uh, we have a global reach uh, of around 190 countries where we are represented either locally or a food uh, distributor as well. We have about 65,000 employees and we invest in R&D uh, heavily above 1 billion every year. You can see here um, the type of products we have in our portfolio, which really cover from the discovery, um, for instance, enabling research inside and outside cells for diagnostic medication management and therapy management. But let's focus on antigen testing. So first of all, there are different tests and they are appropriate for different types and different, ta um, different type of diagnostic as well. So as it's well known, molecular diagnostic is considered as one of the gold standard, but rapid antigen tests can be very fast, can be done at a point of care testing and will give results in 15 minutes. So there are key advantages of um, rapid antigen test outside of an acute care setting uh, and will focus also on the detection of symptomatic patients, residents or staff member with high risk of exposure. 
Last but not least, there are serology tests, which are blood-based tests that will really look at the presence of antibodies produced in response to the infection. So when do uh, you need to test for SARS-CoV-2? I think uh, we have increased our knowledge in the past year, unfortunately, for this pandemic on the different type of tests and when they should be used. Uh, there are a few criteria to take into consideration. What the testing objective are, uh, diagnostic, um, quarantine, screening, what are the patient's conditions and potential exposure? What is the access of uh, care uh, in a lab point of care? And how quickly do we need the answer? The antigen test on the graph is represented by the orange curve. And you can see that basically you can use such tests um, within seven days uh, since symptoms onset. And that's when you will have a higher likelihood of having an antigen test and detect infectious patients. I just want quickly to remind what are the WHO uh, performance requirements for such tests. The sensitivity uh, should be at the minimum 80%, uh, ideally 90%, and the specificity above 97 or 99%. Different specimen type can be used nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab, but also nasal swab, nasal wash, and sputum. Let me introduce you with a BD varietal system. So that's a very small instrument. It's basically the size of an end, more or less. It's really a digitally, digitally read lateral flow immunoassay. Uh, that will allow you basically to remove the subjectivity of the results by reading a lateral flow test. It will be more accurate, will detect potential positive that the eye may not be able to read, and also improve specificity with line that you think you are seeing but are uh, truly not present. It's a point of care device. Uh, it has been uh, on the market for many years now. And we already have a proof product for influenza, A and B, RSV viruses as well, and group A strep. So at a high level, when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, that's a very easy to use system. We are using a mid nasal swab collection. So very simple workflow. I will show you on the next slide the workflow. Very easy to read. It's fast results. Uh, will be delivered in 15 minutes. And there is an option to, um, uh, for connectivity through informatic system. So here's how you process the, step, the, um, the test. First, you collect a mean nasal swab from the patient. You will insert this swab into the small tube that is provided with the kit and you will mix the sample for 15 seconds with a reagent and then remove the swab. After that, you close the small dispensing cap, which includes a small pipette, and basically you will dispense three drops into the window uh, for the migration of the liquid on the lateral flow. You insert the device into the analyzer, and 15 minutes later, you will get your results on the screen. There are two ways the analyzer can be used what we call an analyze, an analyze now mode or a batching mode where you can walk away, which allow you to batch samples uh, if you have multiple patients to test at the same time. We have an informatics solutions that will allow uh, results reporting, also remote services and LIS connectivity. I want to spend a little bit more, more time on the performance of a product and the rigor that went into the product development activity. So the way we conduct um, such development at BED is first with a screening of available antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. We identified and tested more than 100 antibodies either for the spike protein or the nucleocapsid protein. Very Quickly, we decided to focus on the nucleocapsid protein because it's at a higher abundance. So you ha will have a better limit of detection for the test. And it's less prone for mutation compared to the spike protein. 
We do testing in a large scale, either in ELISA, in Sandwich ELISA, deep stick before moving to a full lateral flow device. We have tested recombinant protein, heat or gamma irradiated viruses, as well as clinical samples. The most promising pair of antibodies went through um, a series of optimization and um, confirmation of the performance to choose the most promising one. When we have chosen the antibodies and when we have done the optimization work, then we do all the series of analytical validation that will support the performance of a product. So a series of these studies include, but are not limited to the limit of detection, what we call the high dose hook effect and the cross reactivity. The limit of detection has been established uh, in presence of clinical samples. And we achieve an LOD at 1.4, 10 to the 2 TCID 50 per ml, which in genome equivalent is around 10 to the 5th. We generally try to test as well a very high dose of the virus just to verify we don't have false negative with this type of conditions because it could happen with lateral flow immunoassay. It did not happen in that case. Cross-reactivity was evaluated as well with a panel of very high prevalence respiratory pathogens that could potentially cross-react, and you'll have this list of pathogens on the right side of the slide. We didn't observe any. Interfering substances, so we test um, um, substances that can be used for treatment, for instance, or can be present naturally uh, in the patient samples, and we didn't observe any type of interference. We also uh, performed a study where you test a very low load of SARS-CoV-2, so very close to the LOD, uh, mixed with a very high load of another pathogen that can be present to verify that you will systematically detect the low load of SARS-CoV-2, and so not induce false negative. We didn't observe any false negative in this study. The reproducibility study is a study that will help you to verify the accuracy of your device across multiple days, multiple users, different reagent lots, and in our case, different instrument deliverator system. You test a range of samples that are calibrated in terms of concentration. In our case, uh, we didn't observe any false negative or false positive with the negative samples. Let's move to the clinical performance, which I think is a more testimonial of a true performance of a product. So we have um, conducted a series of studies. The first one has been used for our emergency use authorization in the US and our C mark um, in Europe. So we compared the deliverator system with a PCR assay as well as uh, another antigen test uh, that is already on market as well uh, from Quidel. We had uh, two studies, uh, above 250 patients for each of them, multiple collection sites, uh, more than um, 16, uh, which is a quite a large um, study when you think about the different type of settings that we went to, nursing home, research clinics, outpatient centers, drive through as well. And we collected a uh, different sample and different sample type to run these studies. Against PCR, the BD variator antigen test uh, demonstrate a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 100%. We observe five false negative for which the nasopharyngeal swab uh, CT values for the PCR assay were um, above 25, and you can see that on the right side of the graph where you have CTs at uh, 25, 27, uh, and, and behind that have not been detected. We need just to um, highlight here that it's a very challenging comparison because we compare a nasopharyngeal swab to a nasal swab, and uh, it's described that nasopharyngeal swab will be a little bit more sensitive as well. When we compared the variator results to an antigen test on market, we had a very good agreement between the two devices. 
However, there is one PCR positive that was missed by Veritor, but five PCR positives that were missed uh, by the SOFIA test. So generally speaking, there are more positives that were detected by uh, the Veritor assay in comparison to PCR. We performed an additional uh, clinical study uh, in different settings, still against PCR as described earlier. Uh, we had very close to 200 patients. This population uh, in this study reflects the intended use population. Again, outpatient settings, walk-in clinics, dry food testing facilities, and about 16 geographical sites again. In this specific study, the sensitivity was a little bit higher, 93.5%, and the specificity at 99.3%. We enrolled patients that display two or more self-reported symptoms that were uh, consistent with COVID. I just want to highlight one of the last study uh, that has been uh, recently published uh, in clinical infectious disease. It has been performed in collaboration with Johns Hopkins Hospital here in the US. And the idea was to compare the antigen performance against viral culture. We chose a viral culture method that is uh, quite sensitive, um, as you will see on one of the next slide. We also performed PCR uh, as well in this study. So when you look at the performance of the antigen test against viral culture, the sensitivity was 96.4 and the specificity 98.7, which gave us uh, an overall agreement accuracy of 98.4. So very strong correlation between the antigen test and the viral culture. As a comparison, the PCR demonstrated 100% uh, sensitivity, but a lower specificity at 95.5. The graph on the right show the distribution of load uh, for the negative um, uh, in culture versus the positive in culture, and the dot reflects the positivity for the antigen test. So we can see again here a very strong correlation between uh, the antigen test and uh, the viral culture. This graph is a very nice way to illustrate uh, the overlap of sensitivity between the different methods. And really it um, demonstrates clearly that an antigen test will correlate much better with the presence of infectious diseases, with an infectious virus, sorry, uh, compared to PCR. PCR being highly sensitive will detect remnant RNA and not infectious virus, even dead virus or shading RNA that you may have in the late phase, even after the infection, when patients have been reported to be positive even after 30 days. The antigen test here in yellow correlates extremely well with the sensitivity curve of a um, culture that we have used uh, uh, in this study by Dr. Picots. So where the Biliverator test um, is currently available and approved, so um, we have an emergency use authorization in the US. We have a C mark on the, this test, Health Canada and TGA approval as well. And you can see here the list of countries in which the test has already been approved uh, outside this region, the ones that are under review or under preparation. So let me conclude uh, on, on the value and the performance of the antigen test, and specifically in this case, the BD Verator system and assay. So based on the two clinical um, comparison that I discussed previously, based on the study against viral culture, we clearly demonstrate a very high accuracy of um, the test against PCR within five to seven days in symptom onset in symptomatic population. We have also demonstrated a very high correlation with viral culture. 
which really supports the differentiation between contagious individuals from non-contagious individuals. So um, this essay can diagnose infectious individuals rather than COVID at all stages of illness. Uh, in conclusion, this is likely more than just a diagnostic tool. This is clearly a public health oriented tool. So thank you. Uh, please again, put your questions in the chat and uh, I will leave time um, for that diasoran. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Celine, for the wonderful presentation. To repeat your words, indeed, uh, some of these tools are not just uh, uh, tools, but they go beyond uh, just public health uh, tools as well. It's all about uh, humanity. Uh, moving forward, um, we are going to hold on to the questions and then take on the second presentation, which is going to be presented by, uh, co-presented by Massimo Rosa. Uh, Massimo is the regional director, uh, Europe, Central Africa, uh, Central Asia and Africa for diasory, as well as uh, he's going to be helped by his colleagues, Jan Antonio, um, who's a global export application uh, specialist, uh, at diasory as well, together with uh, Vena Dongeni, uh, the area manager for Sub-Saharan Africa for diasory. Uh, Massimo uh, and colleagues, uh, over to you. Okay. Okay. I start to sharing. Good. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Yes. So first of all, thanks for uh, hosting us. This is our first opportunity to show our face uh, in such uh, environment. And thank you everybody for inviting us. Uh, together with my team uh, today, uh, we are trying to introduce, uh, first of all, uh, our company, uh, our approach. Uh, uh, and also our COVID panel with the focalization uh, within the antigen, which is the topic uh, of today. Uh, Happy New Year as well, because it's the first occasion we meet each other in this 2021. Uh, first of all, a very quick uh, on the agenda, quick company overview, product portfolio and COVID antigen as the main focus of the day. Regarding the Asorin, uh, briefly, I, I want just to introduce ourselves. Uh, we are a, a multinational uh, Italian group. Uh, we are listed on our stock market, of course. Uh, the Asorin SPA consisting of uh, 24 different companies uh, all over the world, five foreign branches, offices uh, in the same five continents. And actually, we are organized with five manufacturing facilities, uh, two in US uh, and uh, the rest of the three uh, within uh, Europe, Germany, UK and, and Italy. It's a company with uh, 50 years of experience. We are on the stage since uh, 1968. We are one uh, of the leading high-tech players uh, in in vitro diagnostic market, in particular in immunodiagnostic and also molecular diagnostic segment. Uh, basically, if we're discussing about the immunodiagnostic market, uh, our company is one of the last that is able to uh, present uh, and pushing uh, on the market uh, all the panorama uh, from uh, the CLIA system, the automation in immunodiagnosis, uh, to the ELISA system, which is a semi-automation, to the pure manual ELISA uh, assays. Uh, nevertheless, you see on the, last, on the left side of the screen, the liaison family. On the right side, the ATMAX, which is our ELISA system. Today, the focus will be more on the CLIA because uh, the panel for COVID has been developed uh, for the CLIA uh, technology. And regarding the CLIA, the liaison family platform is uh, summarized within uh, one cartridge, one uh, integral. Uh, this is valid for all our assay we develop, not only for the COVID. Uh, we use the same cartridge for all the family of liaison uh, from the newest, which is the liaison XS, to the liaison XL, XLRS, and the liaison. So you see that we have a quite broadband, uh, uh, we can say, um, gamma of products for the CLIA, all summarized within one cartridge for each assay, using all the same raw material. This is a cube, clearly a good advantage from technology and sales standpoint. Uh, the liaison family collection, so the menu that we can offer on the CLIA, it's 
enormous. There are more than 120 different assays. If you're just focalizing on the CLIA panel, you see that we develop already, I'm talking about uh, April of last year, uh, unfortunately, Italy and our area where the company's headquarters is close by to the pandemic uh, spread out, close by in between Milan and Torino, to be clear. So I think the patient number one in Europe has been unfortunately discovered and spread in Italy in that area. Our panel started with the IgG S1, S2 to the IgM, talking about the month of May, then with the antigen, which is the subject of today. And nowadays we launch also the new trimeric uh, IgG test for the vaccine support. Talking about the antigen, again, the context of today, I want just to introduce the products and some concepts that also the colleague from BD already explained in a sense, but I think repeating some time is also supporting. Uh, the Asori launched these products in October 26, 2020. Uh, we can summarize as a high throughput antigen test, which is a quantitative test, first uh, things to underline, uh, develop uh, as called SARS-CoV-2 in symptomatic patients using nasal and nasopharyngeal swabs. These are the two bullets we can play. Uh, this new high throughput antigen test is used, as I say, a chemiluminescence immune assay, so a CLIA technology. Uh, to determine either SARS-CoV-2 or nucleocapsid protein antigen. So our focus is nucleocapsid, despite the IgG, which is going to work into spikes, is a different story. For uh, quantifying the viral load of the infection directly from a patient or individual suspected for COVID-19. Uh, this antigen test can offer a real alternative and more and more in the last months, uh, due to the fact that we have a very high sensitivity with PCR gold standard, uh, we realize that more and more can be an alternative solution in case where molecular PCR is not available. And unfortunately, in many countries, we have lack of this kind of material. And uh, sometimes it's also too expensive also. And in cases uh, where the traceability of clinical samples need to be improved, so in all the contact tracing uh, approach that in many countries are, uh, are managing, as well as quarantine management uh, where is needed. Interested to understand uh, how can we find an application, uh, the antigen test uh, in the COVID, uh, to considering uh, the curve, so-called viral load curve, that we are very familiar to analyze uh, in the COVID. The peak is within the five days, as we know. Larger it is uh, the possibility to detach, better it is, uh, considering that our uh, antigen can be that has been, uh, we can say, developed uh, with performance very high till the 10 days from the symptoms, on set symptoms. We have two kinds of opportunities. One, to manage with the PCR a very high sensitivity approach, but a very low frequency of testing for the reason that we know. Other possibility is also to have uh, with the rapid test, a lower sensitivity, but very high frequency because can be also using as a point of care. In the case of antigen on the CLIA, we have emerging the two possibility to have a certain high frequency approach using a very high automation and very high throughput of the test together with a very close sensitivity almost close 100 percent with the pcr so we merge the quality of, of both situations to try to give to the uh, to the market to the healthcare system solution automated and very close to one that is the gold standard which is still the gold standard which is the pcr or of angel the WHO guidelines already mentioned before are identified the antigen test. First of all, the virus uh, target virus is nucleocapsid protein. Uh, we know that the timing request is in the range of 10 and 30 minutes. Uh, we know that the test requires nasal or nasopharyngeal swab samples. Alternative can be also potential saliva uh, approach, which is much more useful and perhaps um, easier to manage in specific area of population. The assorting is also working behind these third opportunities. Performance request, as already mentioned before, sensitivity above 80%. In Italy, they are also in Italy, in Europe, the CDC also showing data above 90% as a threshold, but nevertheless, we keep the 80 from WHO. And uh, for sure, uh, to optimize the performance testing within antigen test uh, should be conducted within the five, seven days following the onset symptoms. These are the, you can say, the main uh, roadblocks or guidelines given the WHO. In terms of positioning, uh, for sure, is going to be a test uh, which is uh, interesting to approach where the NAT is unavailable or where PCR can prelude the clinical utility of the test. And as I mentioned before, to manage specific uh, quarantine or management of specific outbreak investigation 
in specific area like prison, cruise ship, uh, airport or whatever. So find the antigen test for cause the sensitivity, the performance are very high, closer to the, the PCR. Uh, positioning, which is a, a clearly diagnostic approach. That was not the case at the beginning of, of the pandemic. Nowadays, uh, is more and more. So this assay has been C market, has been uh, FDA uh, market. We have a uh, plant uh, actually in US, which is producing and distributing directly on the US market. This assay, as I say, is a quantitative solution. So this is important to define. Uh, do contact tracing and rapid implement isolation procedure is one of the main scope that uh, the, the test has been developed. Um, we can say that uh, due to the high throughput uh, of the test and the automation of the test, this uh, can give to the user the possibility to test the patient quickly, rapidly in a great numbers. Uh, but of course, this also has to be done into a biosafety approach. So the safety, because we are managing a, a, a very high virus charge, is also important for us. And later on, you will see how the Asorin accomplished with this safety interaction of the users. Okay, Massimo, thank you for the floor. Now we will see uh, some technical specification in order that you can understand uh, uh, the, the, the step and the characteristic of, of the essay. So, Partially, it is already uh, introduced by, by Massimo. We are talking about uh, a CLIA assay for the quantitative determination of SARS-CoV-2 nucleoclapsid protein antigen in upper respiratory specimens. Type of uh, sample um, is uh, the na uh, nasal swab, are the nasal swab and nasopharyngeal swab eluted in viral transport media, UTM and BTM. So the type of collation are uh, basically at the moment two, nasal swab dry and nasopharyngeal swab uh, eluted in uh, transport media. Uh, the platform at the moment uh, is uh, the Liaison Excel, uh, that is our, no, our uh, top gamma instrument. And uh, in the near future also, the uh, will be extended on the rest of the Liaison family. Time to first result. This is very, very important uh, because uh, is uh, uh, part of the automation. It's one of the characteristics uh, that uh, make uh, a good merge between the quality of the assay and uh, the automation. So the assay integration into the instrument. In fact, uh, we can perform uh, the, uh, the test in 36 minutes. So the time to first result is uh, 36 minutes. Consider a throughput. Uh, this is uh, also is a very important uh, um, parameter to observe, and uh, we are able to reach 136 test hour with a sort of working sheet uh, number of tests that is approximately around 700. What about the, the claims that are uh, well declared also in our instruction for use and here for your a rapid uh, interpretation, we put a summary. So we have uh, clinical sensitivity and clinical specificity for nasal swab dry that uh, uh, is very, very good, considering that within the 10 days onset symptoms, and we are 98.6 for clinical sensitivity and 100% uh, for clinical specificity, specificity on uh, nasal swab. For nasal pharyngeal swab in viral transport media, we are talking about 98.9 and 99.5, always refer, and this is another important parameter, always referring to the within 10 days onset symptoms. What about the results interpretation? This is our, uh, the threshold that uh, are recently uh, were uh, recently updated in our instrument, our uh, instruction for use. So we introduced also a gray zone recently, and uh, uh, the results are automatic automatically calculated on TCID 50 ml. So there is an automatic uh, interpretation done by the instrument software in order to generate results on TCID 50 ml. So these are the threshold, less than 100 negative, between 100 and 199.9 equivocal, gray above, to above equal 200 positive. So um, 
we have to uh, to remember that we are talking about a quantitative essay. So uh, why I, I, uh, I like this? Because uh, it is possible in an automatic way because the specimen diluent, it is uh, included uh, in the integral kit. It is uh, in case of need to perform an automatic dilution with a dilution factor already recommended on the, our instruction for use one to 10. It is possible with a, a proper programming of the uh, instrument software, it is possible in case of need and for results above the uh, essay range to perform automatically a dilution of the patient. This is, uh, is a good slide to, uh, that because it summarizes our workflow uh, and uh, it, it, it gives immediately the picture of the uh, procedure to perform depending by the type of collection, specimen collection that you perform. And uh, it gives also the flexibility uh, uh, related to this type of specimen collection because uh, you know, we have uh, a couple of, uh, uh, for the moment, the saliva is ongoing. We have a couple of uh, um, type of collection, nasal swab dry and nasal pharyngeal swab in UTM and BTM uh, transport media. And after this uh, uh, collection, uh, you have uh, six hours uh, at two eight uh, and two, 12 hours at two eight, depending by the type of collection to uh, perform the, um, the test uh, to arrive in the biosafety cabinet because the biosafety cabinet, uh, it is an important step to, uh, to perform. Why? Because uh, we are uh, uh, really uh, focused as a company on, uh, on the safety of the end user. And for this reason, because we are talking about virus, it is very important uh, the step of the inactivation of the, of the, of the virus. And for this reason, uh, depending by the, uh, by the type of specimen collection, we uh, recommend an activation uh, using a buffer that is provided by the company of 30 minutes for the nasal swab and 120 minutes for the uh, uh, nasal pharyngeal swab in UTM or VTM in order to uh, practically inactivate the virus, but also, and this will be clear, uh, more clear in the next slide, also to stabilize the protein in order to perform the last step after a command the centrifugation of the sample to perform the test in, uh, in a condition, uh, in, uh, in the best condition, because you have stabil stabilized the protein into the instrument. So basically to, uh, uh, to summarize the importance of the uh, step to inactivate the virus is also because uh, you know uh, into the lab, uh, you can create aerosol and it can be spread this uh, aerosol uh, through the lab. So it is very important, especially for the automation of the, of the, of the test to uh, inactivate the virus. But don't forget also the aspect to stabilize the sample in order to perform uh, at, the, at the best the procedure into the instrument. So this is, uh, uh, with Massimo, we, uh, we introduced uh, also a couple of slides. We put it in the presentation, a couple of, of slides, uh, because uh, they are uh, significant uh, in, in terms of uh, approach with antigen. So uh, in one of the big area in Italy, called Greater Romagna, that is uh, cl close to Bologna in the center of, uh, of Italy, uh, this is a, a good example of Hub and Spock laboratory model, where they implemented, they implemented the antigen already in the routine uh, since November 2020. And uh, as you can see, this example of uh, Hub and Spock laboratory model is done by four uh, uh, big, uh, lab, uh, let's say, big hospital. Laboratory on site seven tests performed per year, we are talking about 21 million. This is the population of the area. And for you, it is important to concentrate the attention about the time of swab that they perform every day. So we are talking about 7,000 swab per day. 
Okay. In the next slide, why it is important to focus the attention on 7,000? Because in the in this slide we summarize uh, how they switch uh, to perform uh, part of this 7,000 swab on the uh, antigen, and they introduced inside the routine the antigen um, uh, test. And uh, uh, during November, December, they screen uh, this number of individuals patient. We are talking about uh, 13,000. Uh, with this, uh, they uh, confirmed the, uh, the number of positive uh, on 99.8 because uh, on 13,000, they got uh, a total positive on antigen 260 and the true positive uh, confirmed then by PCR on uh, 232. So in the end, uh, you can see the high specificity of this test introduced in, in the real routine. So to close, thank you, Jan. Uh, the presentation let the time to discuss uh, with the audience. Uh, this uh, rapid diagnostic answer, uh, starting with the first test, 36 minutes, has a very high throughput, under 36 tests per hour, as Jan says. So we talk about 700 tests per day. Useful as a value proposition to stop the COVID-19 transmission through target insulation and cohorting of the most infectious cases and their close contacts. Important in the antigen, consider the, the potential to expand access to testing and guarantee also the traceability due to the lack of other resources like PCR difficulties and costing. And for sure, identification individuals suspected to have COVID by their healthcare provider within the first 10 days from the onset symptoms. And this is a crucial thing because uh, it's important to detach a patient which is positive, it's important to quarantine the patient, but also to release the patient in the right time. We cannot keep the hospital full of people, uh, even if the PCR is positive after, after the specific timing or specific uh, uh, number of cycles. So antigen uh, in this case is also useful to release a patient when the infection is not any more dangerous for the population. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you both uh, for the wonderful uh, presentation uh, uh, as well. Uh, now we're getting into the question and answer segment. Interesting questions, lots of them are actually coming through the chat box. Uh, so please keep them coming. I see questions around specimen collection. Uh, what types of specimens? Is it nasopharyngeal, um, nasal swabs, even saliva? Uh, questions around performance as well coming through, uh, up to questions around uh, physical characteristics as well, such as uh, pack size and uh, storage. Um, colleagues, let me take the first few questions uh, as we go through uh, this uh, long list. And uh, I would like to start with the one from Alemwek uh, Adenuga. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. He or she is asking, how can we ensure appropriate sample collection? Let me start with uh, Selim. Thanks. So um, when it comes to sample collection for the BV variator kit, right now we um, validated only healthcare provider collected samples. And so um, you, you really have to follow uh, obviously what is in our um, intended, um, sorry, packet insert. Uh, however, we are currently uh, looking at running additional studies where the swab will be self-collected by the patient. And we are providing, even if needed, uh, some small video that you can leverage for the sample collection. Uh, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Celine. So it's only provider uh, uh, collection uh, at the moment. Is it the same uh, with uh, you, Massimo, uh, and uh, uh, Antonio? Who is, um, who do you advise to collect specimens for, for the diacetyl antigen? The liacetyl. Sure. Uh, 
yes, in the sense that in the instruction for use, if I if I catch the question correctly, in the instruction yeah. for use, we have uh, a list of uh, uh, patients that they were tested in a different condition, in different uh, um, segment okay and uh, based on this uh, there are uh, the, the 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 claim defined on the instruction for use thank you um thank you so it depending uh, it depending by the type of uh, patient uh, collecting and also the site and the period we have different claims different claims different uh, uh, value declared so it can be collected even by non health workers yes okay thank you um Celine, you mentioned that this test goes beyond clinical use uh but also up to public health use as well and pascal is asking can you describe briefly what are the some of the unique public health decisions that this test could enable us uh, uh to do and uh, as compared to more classical tests since uh it identifies infectious patients yeah, so let me start by saying that right now our claims are only for symptomatic patients or according to, for instance, what FDA uh, said multiple times, you can test asymptomatic as long as they are in a population that is considered at risk or being exposed to COVID-19. Uh, that being said, we have seen the BD vehicle system used, for instance, in nursing home. Um, we have seen the BD vehicle system used in airports. Uh, for screening, and it has driven some of uh, uh, public health decisions. So we, we have examples at airports where if a test is positive, uh, the visitors will have to isolate for two weeks and reflect reflects the testing to a PCR test to verify the positivity. And it's a very successful program that we have seen in few places. In nursing home, that's a way to test and do surveillance program for both the healthcare workers as well as the residents. And in some places, they are also testing the family members who want to visit to make sure they have a safe environment within, um, uh, within the nursing home. So I'm, I'm just giving you a few examples um, uh, on the way it has been used. We start also to see a lot of traction in a school or university as also a screening method. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Celine. And um, just also want to pick up on the comment from Faisayo in the chat. He has just dropped now. He's saying, yes, I agree with you. Um, the, the, he's thinking or her thinking is that in public health problem solving approach, point of care at community uh, level could be the one to go uh, with minimal technicalities and equipment uh, for that it can be vital. Uh, moving on, um, I want to pick up on this one from Rex, uh, Rex Chikara, uh, who is asking an interesting question applicable to, I think, all of the presenters. Rex says, um, for someone who has tested positive for COVID-19, they may remain PCR positive for, it goes up to 90 days, uh, he says. Does it mean the antigen test is a better test for infectiousness than PCR? I think it's important to clarify this. Yeah, uh, if, I may, if I may say something regarding our, our part, uh, what has been uh, defined also with the study that uh, has been shown by Gian Antonio, uh, unfortunately PCR can stay positive for longer because uh, still uh, we remain a sort of uh, viral uh, noise in the background. So using the antigen uh, after uh, or days uh, or the number of the cycle that is made by the PCR, if the antigen is negative, uh, then in that case, uh, the patient can be considering uh, not anymore in a sense dangerous for infectious approach. So already, for example, in Italy, it is, is the case, uh, after a certain time or after the results of the PCR, above a certain number of cycle, and if the antigen is, uh, is negative, then the patient is released. So uh, this, in a sense, antigen solve a little bit this uh, tremendous dilemma, how the patient has to be still in quarantine or for how much time. Uh, this is helpful a lot in this pandemic approach. Yes, uh, if I can add something, we are talking about uh, the famous cutoff at 33 
uh, tritial cycles. So it seems that uh, over the 33 is not any more uh, uh, contagious. This is what. Uh, mistake, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is always important for us to clarify this. Uh, as we all know, I think currently our gold standard has been PCR. Yeah. Um, but however, it's not always available everywhere. Uh, and then in terms of public health approach, I think we also see some of these innovative diagnostics coming through, uh, such as the RDTs and be able to test as many people that we would not have managed to test without uh, the PCR. So I think that, that is also very important to capture. Moving on from there, I think there were questions around uh, performance. Um, and I remember, I think, uh, Massimo, in your presentation, you referenced to the WHO uh, recommended standards where they talked about 80%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 80%. Sorry. 80% uh, sensitivity, uh, as well as the high uh, specificity of about 97 somebody was asking, how sensitive are these tests? Uh, let me, I know you touched on that, Celine, maybe just to clarify uh, to the uh, uh, one of our audience. Don't know if, if you can answer, yeah. Yes, yes, so uh, the, uh, the claims, uh, the claims uh, based on the WHO uh, guideline uh, are absolutely over the, above this, uh, this uh, uh, specification recommended, okay? So we are talking about uh, uh, very close to 100%, basically, okay? And for both, for both the type of uh, specimen. And uh, this is the, the one of the added value because uh, uh, in combination with the high throughput and the combination of the fact that uh, you can perform a, a specific collation based on the PCR collation, okay? But then performing on the CLIA system, you can, uh, of course, uh, get the claims in terms of sensitivity and specificity very high. Just to add something, uh, considering, go back to the previous question linked to this, uh, still the gold standard is PCR and PCR in nasopharyngeal. So all the reference should be considered in that range, just to clarify what are the standard today. And as Jan say, we are in the range of almost 99%. Thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And uh, well. this, is, this is confirmed also by the experience of the Dr. Sambri in the Greater Romania uh, Abespoc uh, uh, site, where they are uh, since, from, since uh, uh, November 2020 working already in the routine, uh, in the daily routine. So uh, we are really close to 100%, 99 point something. Thank you. Moving on. Um, uh, Celine, uh, I want to come back to you on this one. Um, this one is from Feisayo as well. Again, uh, he says, since the performance of both antigen kits uh, have been compared to PCR technology as a reference uh, presented with focus on sensitivity and specificity, are we able to get any ideas on negative and positive predictive values? Yes, uh, you can definitely get uh, the data on negative and um, positive predictive value. I don't have the numbers on top of my head, uh, obviously, and it depends on the prevalence you have locally, because that's a factor that will uh, be taken into consideration uh, when you evaluate PPV and NPV. Um, I, I can go back to his question and, and provide the information if needed by email. Um, but again, we just need to be careful on the studies that are done as part of the EUA submission, for instance, because there are requirements in terms of positive and negative samples. So it's not a, a classic clinical trial where you have a specific positivity rate. So you probably need to evaluate PPV and MPV of tests with different prevalence rates to really understand what will drive uh, these numbers in a regular setting with a known prevalence. Thank you, thank you again. I, I know our time is uh, running away from us. Um, before it really goes away, I want to tackle this question that came through um, from Victor, uh, my good friend, Victor. Victor is asking, after all this has been said, what is the guidance around how we manage waste, uh, waste management around this test? Any guidances that you have at present? So you're asking after the pandemic? 
yes, uh, any concerns around waste management, it could be uh, pre or post uh, usage of, 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 of the of, of the, the kits. Uh, are there any guidance? Are there any chemicals or anything that we should be concerned about? So for the BDVI talk kit, um, we have studies demonstrating that the virus, virus is fully inactivated in the buffer we have. So we still recommend that uh, you, you treat the device and the buffer uh, in a BSL-2 environment and it's aligned with the CDC guidelines, uh, obviously, uh, but the material is not infectious anymore. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding the azorin, uh, as you saw from Angel Antonio's presentation, uh, we have this inactivation buffer that has been applied uh, and we have a specific guidelines uh, to follow in order to deactivate it 100%. So uh, this is not to compromise. It's our uh, IFU declaration and uh, for this reason we don't want to compromise the timing needed for the activation. So there are uh, rules in place for that. Yes, thank you. Um, that is covered on the element of uh, safety. Uh, as well um, as well as, but how about disposal? Uh, any any guidance with regards to disposal? No specific for the disposal, as Selim uh, already answered. So that is uh, the basic one that is managing for the piece one as well for collecting. So nothing else, nothing more. Okay, thank you very much. Um, last question, I think, uh, if I were to pick one, I think it follows up on the element of BSCs. Uh, and I can't remember who that was from. Uh, I think it was Edwin Ochien uh, who had mentioned, since the presenter mentioned uh, the use of uh, activation and use of, are we saying this is, uh, is, is it therefore recommended in a field where the BSC is not available? Massimo? Sorry, can you repeat? I think. Uh, the element of the BSC, uh, is it a strict requirement uh, such that we can rule out the test kits where there are no BSCs? Antonio? I, no, I, I, no, I don't catch the type of question, sorry. Okay, uh, no, that's that's all right. Uh, so what we will do, uh, since it's about a minute to go, uh, quite a number of questions that remain in the chat, very important indeed. So okay. we shall request that we send these questions to you uh, and yeah. you may be able to respond to us as soon as possible so we can be able to share with our presenters. Um, in 15 seconds, Celine, uh, any, any closing remarks? Thank you. No, first, thanks for the invitation uh, to speak today. A very good presentation for, for both companies. Uh, I, I think... Uh, we need really to understand how these products will be used now that we have also vaccination available or soon to be available in some countries and understand how these tests will uh, be part of the solution first to control the pandemic as public health tool as I described and monitoring uh, the vaccination efficiency as well. Thank you, thank you Celine. Um, Massimo or Antonio, any of you in 30 seconds? Yeah, I want to thank again uh, all the audience uh, for the patient. Uh, again, as Celine says, uh, we are in a phase uh, which is different, a different part of the, of the world. Uh, actually, what I can say that we have enough tool to manage the pandemic, the pre -pand the during pandemic and the after pandemic and the vaccination phase. Now we have the tools. I think most of the, the things are knowledge are known by everybody. Just a matter to put the piece in all the orders and apply antigen whatever it is rapid uh, not rapid uh, or pcr plus the igg now for the vaccination it's a matter to sit down understand the rules and move on because now we have the knowledge about that in may and april was a different story so i want to leave with a, a pinky thinking uh, in your mind for a, a better future and for uh, me you. again uh, thank you thank you for the invitation for the time offered to us in the for the presentation we'll be very happy to to receive question and uh, answer technically in, in the best way yep. thank you very much uh for the wonderful presentation uh and i'd like to thank all of you who have managed to grace our occasion today uh we have had some very interesting discussions indeed uh, unfortunately, we couldn't finish all the presentations that we 
all the questions that you had and as promised, we will reach out to Antonio, to Celine, and to Massimo to give us the answers for the remaining question. On your screen right now is uh, the code for you to be able to go to the uh, ASLMO Academy and be able to download uh, a certificate should you require um, uh, to do so. We'll keep on bringing on these uh, sessions and our next session is gonna be on Tuesday, an interesting discussion indeed, how these tools that we discussed today are actually being used to reopen economies, schools and everything like that. So till we meet again, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Arrivederci. Here.